Uh, good afternoon from Dhaka. Good morning and good evening to people who are in different time zones. Thank you for joining us for this session uh, of the Gobeshana Conference, which started a few hours ago. I'm not quite sure which number session this is yet. I think it's the fifth or sixth uh, since we started this morning, my time in Dhaka. Uh, this particular session is a hard talk session with the Right Honorable Anne-Marie Trevelyan, Member of Parliament of the UK, who's uh, with a minister for uh, base, I'm not quite sure exactly what base stands for. Maybe she can tell us what the what the acronym is for. But I know her as the uh, the adaptation and resilience uh, uh, COP26 presidency uh, person. And so it is in in that capacity that uh, she uh, kindly agreed to give us some time here today. And we thought it we'd structure it as a, a not a not a very hard hard talk, but a a sort of interview type uh, arrangement where we can get to ask questions and hopefully she'll be able to uh, put our uh, thoughts at rest in terms of how the adaptation, uh, particularly the locally led adaptation issue, which we are very concerned about, uh, will be dealt with in the COP26. Uh, so um, we are very fortunate to have Aditya Bahadur from IID, uh, in International Institute for Environment and Development, as our moderator. So. It's my pleasure to hand over to Aditya and to uh, thank uh, Anne-Marie for being with us here today. I, I know that you're extremely busy and we do appreciate you giving your time to be with us. Aditya, please go ahead. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Salim Bhai. A very good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone who's joining us today. We're absolutely delighted that the Right Honorable Anne-Marie Trevelyan is joining us today for this lively uh, talk show style interview session on adaptation policy and finance. As Salim Bhai rightly said, she is the international champion for adaptation and resilience for the COP26 presidency. She's also the minister for business, energy, and clean growth. So really someone um, uh, who, who's in the eye of the storm when it comes to key topics of discussion around uh, climate and development. Minister, a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And it's so uh, wonderful to see the Gomeshana Conference really uh, kicking off so successfully. I'm looking forward to following it as the, as the week progresses. Wonderful. Just wanted to begin by asking you, tell us a little bit about what the International Champion for Adaptation and Resilience does or is expected to do. Uh, it's a very good question. It's one of the longest titles I think government has come up with. Um, it's, a really, it's a really important part of the COP uh, presidency family team. Uh, I think one of the uh, challenges that we all we all accept is that whilst the Paris Agreement has provided the foundation from which uh, the whole world has uh, agreed that we need to really uh, move forwards and solve uh, the mitigation challenge so that we stop putting greenhouse gases into the air, the reality is that for so many countries, uh, that isn't their key challenge. Their key challenge uh, in dealing with the climate change uh, global emergency is that they are suffering from and can see more climate shocks coming their way. Uh, and as part of uh, the three pillars of uh, the Paris Agreement and obviously how COP26 will run, we have the mitigation challenge, uh, we have the finance challenge, and we have the adaptation challenge. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson was absolutely clear that for him and uh, for the UK as the COP president, this is an absolutely fundamental part of what we want uh, COP26 to be about, is to really get to grips uh, with that adaptation uh, question and to move forwards that agenda. So getting the financing right, but so that those countries who are most susceptible to climate shocks and least able uh, to tackle them uh, without the world's support, uh, have their voice properly heard and that we rebalance between those three pillars to make sure that adaptation and resilience is a central part not only of the COP26 conversation but of the delivery that comes out of that. Right. So I've got the wonderful opportunity really of being the champion for all our developing countries who need that support and who have I think in the past yeah. felt that there, there wasn't a a strong enough uh, leaning in on this part. So it's a really exciting role. And one of the challenges at the moment, of course, with COVID is that I can't get out and about as much as I would like in a physical sense, but uh, you know, opportunities like this to talk to all of you through the virtual world is at least a way to make sure that we are really engaging in this conversation. Yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned delivery in, in your opening remarks because 
that was going to be my first question on could you outline a few key outcomes on adaptation and resilience that the UK is expecting from this summit? And tell us what steps you're taking to ensure that the conference results in tangible gains as opposed to merely eliciting more pledges that don't really come to life. So I think those are two incredibly important questions and they're at the heart of the matter. because I think we're really clear that we need to move uh, to implementing the Paris Agreement. I think of it like a house. The Paris Agreement was putting the foundations in the ground uh, and without those, the house would not have been stable. But we have those, but now we have to implement them. And the world can't wait. We have to get on with doing that. So we're absolutely committed to using our COP26 presidency to encourage much greater political ambition, uh, better tools, uh, better finance tools, and a coordination and a commitment uh, from all those countries across the family to build resilience uh, through support to practical adaptation and disaster preparedness and response so that we really are getting ahead of the climate shock risks. So at a practical level, uh, we're going to be developing activities to deliver on adaptation uh, to avert and to minimize as well as addressing those loss and damage questions so that we can build resilience to climate change and climate shocks by pressing for both additional and I think really importantly more accessible financing uh, encouraging and facilitating those adaptation uh, programs mm -hmm. and that disaster preparedness and response planning which will then it'll then integrate I think the, the international with the national action so that we're really reliably delivering assistance for those countries who need it most. So as the COP presidency, we're gonna be working really closely with all those countries to ensure that the focus is on action. Commitments and pledges are really important. Clearly they're the first step, but our role as president is going to be ensuring that they turn into action. So I've got the amazing role uh, and the uh, challenge of driving that absolutely relentlessly yeah. between now and COP to make sure we deliver. So can I ask, um, COP is already delayed by a few months, so there's obviously a logistical challenge that you've already been facing. But tell us a little bit about what are the main sticking points and challenges that you feel, uh, you know, that you're experiencing in this round of discussions and negotiations? What are some of the hurdles that you have to overcome? What are the key roadblocks um, that you're facing and how are you planning to overcome them? So as ever, this is a, you know, it's a, it's a complex uh, discussion, this one. Uh, and I think our focus is really moving to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. That's always at the front of our minds. And I think how this can be done is largely agreed. Um, but I think what's really crucial is to ensure that countries uh, come forwards, both with ambitious greenhouse gas reduction, reduction pledges, where that's uh, important for their, as their contribution but also plans to deliver adaptation uh, and the ways that they know in their own, in their own nation space, how to avert and to minimize uh, the impacts of climate shocks and how to address loss and damage. And I think this, you know, I don't think there's any question, this will require more funding. And as I said, better access that funding. So that is one of the challenges. So it's about ensuring action and really understanding the progress we're making uh, both in mitigation, obviously, but also in adaptation. And I think there are discussions uh, on the mechanics of reporting uh, and communicating progress on both adaptation and mitigation that we need to continue to work on. So, I think, you know, me, but also the team who are, you know, working in that in the detailed space are really looking forward to building on the work of COP25, mm -hmm. uh, including delivering on the mandate of the Santiago network on loss and damage, uh, where I think there is work to do. Um, in order to agree to how it will actually operate. But I think that's a really important next step um, so that we can get on with delivering. Can I check if you're finding that, uh, that the outbreak of COVID-19 across the world has sidetracked some of these conversations on adaptation and resilience is creating additional challenges for you? Or is it opening up new opportunities in these discussions because people are realizing that risk is ever present and you have to deal with it? and dealing with climate uh, also has co-benefits for dealing with COVID. Any thoughts on how uh, COVID-19 is interacting with your agenda? So, I mean, I think, you know, the challenges of COVID-19 across the world have been uh, immense and for uh, the most vulnerable countries, um, the economic shock has, you know, in many ways been the, the greater impact than, than the healthcare uh, shock itself. And I think that's, 
you know, the, 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 con the continuum of, of the COP conversations has been ongoing, but it's always more difficult, I think, to have those conversations through virtual ways than gathering together. And I think the negotiation teams uh, would all say that it's just that much more difficult um, to right. really get to grips with it all. But I think it hasn't stopped the willingness. Uh, there is there is a, uh, a sense embedded across across all, all parties that actually this is not an issue that we can put on the side while we deal with COVID. And actually that, that shock that it's caused gives an opportunity as we rebuild our, our businesses and our economic growth in a better way that is, you know, as the, as the Prime Minister here says, building back better, building back greener, uh, but in a very real sense, using, you know, this shock as an opportunity to steer all our economies into a a greener and more resilient place and okay. as we invest we are getting that right yeah so in uh, you know when we were when you were talking a minute ago you mentioned that one of the things that you're driving towards is additional and accessible finance but as you're aware 11 years ago at cop 15 industrialized countries pledged to provide a hundred billion dollars every year to developing countries for battling climate change and building resilience by 2020 we are obviously now in 2021 and there is very little faith that this target is being met. As the champion for adaptation and resilience for COP26, what measures are you taking ahead of this summit to help meet this target? Uh, this is such a critical issue, isn't it? And you know, the reality is the international community must deliver on its commitments. Uh, and we need to find ways uh, to get that uh, really on track and visible. So I think as the COP presidency, we've been really clear that we must deliver for those that are at the front line of climate change and collectively honour that 100 billion uh, commitment. Um, so we'll continue to call on donors to demonstrate that required action now. Um, the OECD estimates that uh, just under 80 billion of climate finance was mobilised in 2018, which is an increase on 2017. Um, and recent independent analysis of scenarios for 2019 and 20 uh, does suggest that the impact of COVID-19 will have made it increasingly challenging for that 100 billion to have been met last year. But, you know, I think we remain optimistic and obviously we will continue to be focused on that. Uh, like all these things, there's always a delay, isn't there? So whilst the final figures 2020, I don't think will be fully clear until 2022, um, developed countries really must demonstrate now that they will scale up that climate finance to meet their commitments. So, as the COP presidency, we're really committed to addressing those concerns about both the quantity, um, the quality, and the responsiveness and impact of international climate finance. So we've recently published a paper here in the UK outlining now right. our COP26 priorities for public finance, uh, which I would encourage you know, all the viewers to read. It, it covers across that breadth. And I think closely linked to this, is the predictability of future finance flows, which of course is supporting developing countries planning processes. And that's so important that we get that right. So the UK has called on all climate finance providers to offer clarity and predictability on those future levels of support, uh, including in our Article 9.5 communications uh, through that reporting mechanism. Um, you know, here from the UK, we're trying to really lead by example, and the Prime Minister has committed to double the UK's public international climate finance to 11.6 billion pounds between 2021 and 25. Um, and other countries are also indicating that they will make their future climate finance commitments uh, in the run up to COP26, which is fantastic. Uh, so we're really urging all developed countries to be as ambitious and forward reaching as possible. But I think that predictability so that uh, developing countries can really think through how they can make those investments to help their countries become more resilient yeah. uh, will be really important. So I think you're absolutely right. Predictability, accessibility, clarity are essential. Of course, so is additionality, as you already mentioned. But the other important issue is, you know, accessibility. Institutions, in, institutes like ours have worked towards underlining that not only, you know, is, is it important to generate the right amount of money, but also ensure that it is invested where it matters most, that is at the local level. And we found that less than 10% of all the climate finance in the world reaches poor communities. And we wanted to ask you how you um, will use your position as the host of COP26 and as a champion for adaptation and resilience for ensuring that those at the local level are really empowered to lead adaptation and resilience initiatives 
and have a say in how this climate finance is invested, how it is programmed. Mm. I completely agree. And I think uh, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have to crack because, you know, financing and support must ultimately reach those who need it most. Um, you know, that last mile investment is what we really want to try and break through and get right. I think the principles put forward by the LDCs under the Life AR developed by IAED are really helpful. Um, and we're inviting other donors to join Ireland, ourselves and, the, and Italy who are funding the Life AR initiative at the moment. Because we agree that getting that finance at the local level requires really effective plans, uh, which can be responsive to changing needs uh, and that they're really well embedded at a national level. So it'll also require that the systems can deliver and manage those funds uh, effectively down, down to that grassroots level. So getting that right, you know, I think in a lot of ways will require uh, new partnerships from local communities and governments at national level, along with those international links uh, to assist with finance and capacity building. I think that is, that's probably one of the key, key elements that we need to build on. Um, so, you know, this event bringing together expertise on climate is really central to that. Um, you know, uh, who, who, who can be better to, to share their experience and expertise than those uh, in those countries most experienced in managing climate risk? And, I, you know, at, at, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, you know, I, I do say whenever we're on any, um, you know, uh, conversation with this, you know, Salim's uh, ability to explain uh, you know that Bangladeshi leadership is, is, you know, into the international arena is is world class, and that's so important because it both it both sets out that it's possible to do where some countries are struggling to think that they will achieve it, but also it demonstrates that partnership working is the most effective way to drive it because you need the international partnerships to get the finance frames right. But at the end of the day, delivery is about those local community leaders. Uh, building confidence for communities to learn to adapt and know that uh, the tools they're bringing in will genuinely make their family life and their security stronger than it is now. Right. I think that's a point well taken. I'll take a minute here to request our audience to, uh, as you're listening to this um, lively debate, do please note any questions that you have uh, for the minister in the box that says Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And I'm sure I, I'll make sure that I keep some time at the end um, uh, to put those to her. So I'm glad you mentioned the importance of national planning <laughs> systems, endogenous capacities within communities to become um, more resilient, because one of the challenges that developing countries have faced uh, with enhancing resilience to climate change is the largely sporadic or short term nature of support that has been provided by donors. A three year project here, a five year, five -year project there. You know, it's something begins, something ends. People are not picking up the baton from a project that has finished. So this really inhibits the development of endogenous systems and capacity essential for sustainably battling climate impacts. So what is the UK as a donor and you as the UK's international champion doing to effect a shift in the nature of financing for adaptation to develop stronger country systems and discourage this fly in, fly out technical assistance model uh, that has plagued adaptation and development practice across the uh, global south? Uh, I think that's a really, really critical point. So I think firstly, improving both the quality as well as the quantum of finance is central uh, both to the COPS uh, finance uh, campaign, but also of course to our ANR campaign, which I'm championing. Um, so the systems we use must enable maximum impact in that battle against climate change and tackling those climate shocks. So increasing investment must go hand in hand with mobilizing expertise uh, to ensure that available funding really does achieve maximum impact. And I think this has been made more important in response to COVID uh, and the UK, you know, at a national level here, we're exploring how existing climate funds can be improved and, you know, max maximize um how we how we spend that money to make sure that we're playing our part in supporting a green and resilient global recovery um so we're working directly with key stakeholders on this uh with the mdbs with the dfis and major funds uh things like the green climate fund uh, and the adaptation fund because i think these organizations can do more uh, and more effectively exactly as you say so that we and together we can support 
uh, to deliver better on the ground uh, outcomes and really improve as well this really important stream of work which we've got to get right is that is countries access to climate finance uh, and I think you know in doing that supporting uh, those nations who are needing to build stronger governance systems so that exactly as you say when projects come in to support on a specific you know, area of need, actually those, those skills that are learned, the training that is embedded in that community then becomes part of, uh, you know, the local county or national uh, system so that all that skill and investment isn't lost at the end of a particular program investment. Yeah, I mean, I was part of a big DFID funded adaptation project um, for a few years and I really found that strengthening local institutions, subnational institutions, is, is really that sweet spot which delivers long-term adaptation gains as opposed to the sporadic um, uh, missions as we call them in our business. Um, so I think moving on from this discussion on endogenous systems, I want to talk a little bit about transparency. As you know, <laughs> there is a need for donors to be more transparent about how the climate finance they provide is being used and the proportion of it that is reaching the local level. Mm. Again, what are you doing um, to make to advocate for greater transparency of climate finance, both where uh, how donors may be investing this finance and at what level of governance it's being invested? Because currently I can tell you from our own research at IIED that um, figuring out how much money reaches the local level is very mm -hmm. arduous, very difficult and shrouded in all kinds of mysteries. Tell us a little bit about how you're doing, what you're doing to push the transparency agenda ahead of COP26. Thank you. I think this is terribly important and, and we'll build confidence as well if we can get this right, because I think communicating action on climate change, uh, be that mitigation or adaptation and support is really vital um, if we're going to unlock the full potential of the Paris Agreement. Um, I know that at COP24, where parties adopted the overarching guidelines for a new enhanced tra transparency network, um, there was that real focus on greater requirements for the disclosure of information, including on, on that transparency of support. Um, so COP26 is mandated to try and finalise those specific details of the framework's implementation. Um, and as the COP president, uh, the UK is committed to working together with all parties uh, to really get to grips with and agree those final details. Um, which then will allow enough time for robust implementation. Um, the Paris Agreement also requires all donors to provide forward-looking communications on their climate finance plans. So we've been using our presidency engagement to encourage these uh, to be as forward-leaning as possible. I think coming back to that earlier question of, of needing to provide that, uh, you know, that longer-term uh, stability, not only in finance frameworks, but as you say, in the transparency will help enormously I think for countries who need to who don't feel that you know there's enough there's enough clarity there to see where they can get support in the long term yeah I guess the obvious, obvious follow-up question to this is that we imagine that your position as an advocate for change in this regard will be strengthened if the UK is able to demonstrate its own commitment to transparency and to supporting locally led action for adaptation and resilience can you give us one or two tangible examples of how the UK is doing this now. Absolutely. So I think one of the key ones, and I've, I'm a great champion of it, is, is the fact that we are uh, supporting the LIFE uh, AR uh, programme, the Least Developed Countries Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience. Honestly, it's almost as long a title as mine, isn't it? LIFE <laughs> AR, really, but really, really spot on. Um, because, you know, it's worked towards the vision of having at least 70% of climate change supporting locally led action by 2030 is absolutely spot on and it's got that leadership from those countries who are the most effective uh, so it's absolutely the right way round to be uh, doing business so the UK is really proud to be uh, supporting uh, that program I think in terms of um, examples of you know other examples of how we're doing this I think you know we engage with the World Resources Institute uh, the Global Commission on Adaptation and IIED uh, in the ongoing development of those principles for locally led adaptation um, with uh, UK teams providing input and support to the refinement and application of these principles, uh, including through the engagement at the Community Based Adaptation Conference, which was in October last year. 
Um, and I think an another um, really, really important one from 2014 to 2019, the UK supported the uh, BRACED program, which stands for Building Resilience and Adaptation to Climate Extremes and Disasters across 13 countries. Um, where it was successfully testing a range of effective approaches for working with local actors to build those adaptation and resilience uh, solutions. And I think the many lessons that were learned from BRACED, um, and the re they really were, are still being, they're being actively incorporated into ongoing FCDO uh, programming and investments so that we are in everything that we do going forwards, will have that, that most effective framework of delivery uh, and indeed transparency and how we're doing that built into all our programming coming out of the UK. Right. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you for mentioning these tangible uh, initiatives. And as someone who was part of BRACE, yeah, I mean, I, I know that it really pioneered some new approaches of working with local mm -hmm. communities across South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. So turning to one of my last few questions before we go to the panel is, what are your top two or three asks on enhancing adaptation and resilience from the delegates and negotiators that will attend COP26? I'm only giving you top two or three. <laughs> I was going to say, I've got a long list if you've got all day. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, it's, it's really important. And I think, you know, all of those of us who work in the political arena know that if you want to have success, you want two or three key things which you can really drive forwards and make sure that you know nobody can say they didn't know what they were so i think i think firstly i really want partners to help us to identify practical action that can be taken to increase both the accessibility and the impact of climate finance and obviously speaking personally particularly in the adaptation resilience part of the whole i think for both providers and recipients of finance to make progress uh, on these actions in the lead up to cop26 um, so, as I said, we've referenced this um, in some detail in our recently published paper uh, outlining our COP26 priorities for public finance. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a key one that we want to really embed in everyone's thinking so that it's absolutely uh, part of how we go forwards. I think, secondly, I also want those countries which haven't yet come forwards with clear adaptation plans for them to start the process to publish a NAP, a National Adaptation Plan, uh, and for those that do have them to come forward with the adaptation communication, um, because not only does this help, uh, you know, uh, talking as we were earlier about helping countries to embed, embed their thinking about, you know, they know best what the issues are, what the climate shock threats are. But these these documents with all that thinking that's gone in behind it at, at a local and national level, then support the global stock take. Uh, and it enhances uh, the understanding and the learning which, you know, the finance institutions and donor countries can really uh, make best use of uh, their commitment um, to make sure that we're, you know, being as impactful as possible. So I think um, it's very much, a, I see this very much as a partnership relationship where, uh, you know, those national adaptation plans, that is a really important tool for the whole family to understand the whole COP family to understand where the most urgent risks are and how we can, you know, most effectively embed uh, that resilience investments. And so I think, so I think thirdly, I think, you know, there are challenges which exist for, you know, many countries in, in actually taking these actions. So I really want to understand what they are at a country by country level uh, and what needs to be done to overcome them and make sure we really draw together the expertise that exists um, you know, elsewhere across the COP family to make sure that we are supporting uh, those who need it most. So I'm a very practical person, uh, and I think uh, that's what we need now. In order to build our house on those Paris foundations, we absolutely uh, need to be working uh, hand in hand with each other uh, to get that right. Great, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, in my last question, I'm going to ask you to humor me a little bit, Minister. I'm going to say a few words and we play a little word association game. I I'll say five or six words. You just say the first word that comes to your mind as soon as uh, you hear that word. Okay. Um, COP26. Uh, this year. Resilience. The critical path to success. Local. The solution. 
champion. Very important person. <laughs> uh, vulnerability. Uh, what we need to try and stop. Finally, transparency. Much, much more of it. Fantastic. Thank you so much um, for your answers to these questions. I'm going to turn quickly to my panelists because audience questions are still streaming in. So I want to make sure that we keep five or six minutes at the end for those. I'll turn first to Sanjay Vashisht, who works with the Climate Action Network. Sanjay, a very warm welcome to you on the panel. In about a minute, tell us, give us a flavor of what you do, and then please go ahead and ask the minister your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Minister, for the opportunity. Uh, I work with Climate Action Network South Asia. Uh, I'm based in Delhi, um, and we are a network. Uh, you, you already know that CAN is uh, one of the INGO's constituencies nodal um, uh, organization. And so we have been following climate negotiations, but then we have been also implementing a lot more in terms of adaptation and resilience building uh, on ground. Um, so my question is, uh, thanks for, uh, it's really delighted to hear about, you know, your, you, that you already aware about the climate shocks that uh, developing countries face, um, how adaptation needs to be priority. Um, and, and that actually encourages me to ask a question. I'm sure uh, since implementation of Paris Agreement will be uh, focused, you would need partners. So what um, role uh, UK government envisage uh, about NGOs need to play um, and to raise ambition and also action for adaptation and resilience? That's such an important question, Sanjay. I think you're, you're so right, absolutely critical part. So as the, as the COP president this year, we're absolutely committed um, to securing an outcome that both respects and reflects the interests of all parties, including, of course, the poorest and those most vulnerable to those climate shocks. So uh, we want to be working with civil society uh, across the board to really amplify the voices of those most affected by the climate change shocks so that we really are delivering a truly all of society and inclusive COP. Um, as part of our civil society engagement, obviously we're working with NGOs, uh, indigenous peoples, lots of interest groups, trade unions and faith groups um, to really make sure that we're hearing all the issues uh, which affect different communities uh, in so many different ways, not only physical communities, uh, but all those communities that hold our societies together. Uh, so when I'm engaging with my counterparts, uh, I'm really encouraging countries to take a participatory approach to developing and delivering their NDCs those adaptation plans I was talking about and long-term strategies to make sure that they are seeking the views and the inputs and thoughts from young people, from civil society organizations, and really importantly for me, those marginalized groups such as indigenous peoples and women, even though uh, women and girls make up, you know, more than 50% of the population, often their voice is not heard. They are more likely uh, to be impacted by climate shocks, uh, but often, uh, their needs and indeed their ability to deliver uh, adapt adaptation and resilient solutions isn't as as part of the of the core of those mm. of those NDCs and thinking. So that's really important to me. And I think I believe that vulnerable countries um, and their communities they're at the forefront of our planning for a successful COP. Um, so in addition to the dedicated team set up in our in our COP unit uh, in the UK. Uh, we've also uh, established a number of um, other groups to help guide our civil society engagement. Um, so we've got uh, the CPD-led Friends of COP group, uh, which includes Indigenous people's representation and activists from the Global South, uh, a CPD-led Civil Society and Youth Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. um, the council's co-chaired by two young people uh, to ensure we hear the voices of young people uh, and their civil society. Uh, and we're working closely with this group to help us deliver a really inclusive and successful event. Uh, we're also working with Italy to deliver a Youth for Climate webinar series to galvanize ambition and insight from young people ahead of the youth COP and to feed that into the main COP itself. Uh, and we're also formally participating in the UNFCCC process on action uh, on climate empowerment. So really really important that civil society's voice and the knowledge and the experience that uh, it holds about those communities most affected is really fed right through uh, the system and is at the heart of the cop conversation 
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aditya. I'll invite Stella to please put on her video camera. Um, Ms. Stella Gama, you work with the Least Developed Countries Group. Um, please uh, put on your camera and uh, tell us a little bit about your work in a minute or so, and then please go ahead and ask the minister the question. Uh, thank you very much. Greetings from Malawi. My name is Stella Gama. I'm a director in the Ministry of Forestry and Natural Resources in Malawi. And I am a negotiator on the Malawi team at uh, the Climate Change uh, Conference, and I support the least developed countries. I follow technology transfer and also gender, but I'm also the rapporteur for the subsidiary body on scientific and technological advice. Yeah, since uh, my interest is on gender, my question will also uh, be on gender. Uh, the Right Honorable, it is an honor to interact with you uh, this afternoon. And I'm uh, very happy to know that you are a practical person and that you would like to see tangible actions and tangible gains on the ground. In um, having said that, my question is, what actions are you taking to ensure that women and other marginalized groups in least developed countries are empowered to the impacts of climate change, are empowered to respond to the impacts of climate change? Thank you very much, Right Honorable Anne Marie. Thank you so much, Stella, and it's wonderful to hear that you are part of the negotiating team. It's, uh, it's so important that we have uh, many female voices speaking in there in order that we make sure that we hear that breadth that we need to. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, in answer to your question, so the UK is really committed to hosting an inclusive COP in a very real sense. So. Uh, I'm absolutely passionate about making sure that we champion women and girls leadership uh, and deliver real world impacts that meet their needs. So throughout the run up to COP and of course at the COP itself, uh, we'll be working with other governments, uh, with IFIs, with the UN, with civil society, as we were discussing earlier, and with the private sector and grassroots actors to really build momentum behind these aims so that we can deliver a green, inclusive and resilient recovery from COVID-19 uh, as we move into this next decade. Um, so really important to me, and I've um, asked the COP president delegate to make this a real focus, is that we really press the implementation of the GAP, the Gender Action Plan, which was agreed at COP25, and that we call on all countries and all those other actors uh, in this uh, huge challenge uh, to develop gender responsive climate policies, plans, strategies and actions uh, right through to things like the adaptation communications and the NDCs. Um, I think it's absolutely vital that these are become embedded thinking. So I really want to push for a strengthening of the leadership and the meaningful participation of women and girls in climate action. Um, so this will be in include using UK funding to really level the playing field between men and women uh, within international climate negotiations. Um, and we're investing in the Women Negotiator Mentoring Initiative, which is supported um, under the Climate Ambition Support Alliance. Um, so you are clearly a, a walking uh, example, and as your name suggests, a stellar example of the many more women we want to have in those roles. Um, so we're going to be using UK events uh, and consultation processes to really empower and amplify the voices of those whose views are often most marginalised uh, and really addressing their needs and priorities in the run up to and at COP. Um, and I'm also going to be calling for greater investment in the evidence base to better power, empower women and girls uh, within climate action and to build their resilience. And for the use of disaggregated data by gender, age, disability to really inform climate action in a way that it hasn't uh, to date. So there is there is lots to do in this space. Ella. I don't I don't for a moment suggest this isn't 
uh, a big step that uh, we haven't yet cracked, but it's absolutely critical. And as I always say to anyone who listen, you can have the best men in the world, and you know there's plenty of those, but you're still only using 50% of the potential human capital that you could be. So we need to make sure that all voices are heard and that leadership is found uh, from men and women across the board if we're going to have the best outcomes for our communities. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll call on the third panelist, uh, Sunil, who works with Practical Action. Sunil, please put on your camera, tell us a little bit about your work, and then please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thanks, Aditya. Uh, pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Sunil Asare, and I work with Practical Action. At Practical Action, we put engineers' ideas into work so that people in poverty can change their world. And climate change, tackling climate change is core of what we do. So uh, to right honorable minister, um, my question today is about uh, the importance of innovation. <coughs> the role of innovation in effective adaptation and building resilience of the communities in the front lines of climate change in the global south is undisputed. However, most of the innovation is led by the global north and the process lacks participation of those who need it the most. And when such innovation are available, they don't reach down there where it is needed. As the UK's international champion on adaptation and resilience, what are you doing to change this? Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. And I think that's a really, really important challenge. Um, so we're working really closely with leading experts from both the North and the South. Uh, and I fully agree uh, on the importance of using the vast expertise that there is in the Global South. So as part of our campaign, um, the UK is looking to run learning events and dialogues to really foster learning from the South, both South-South, South-North learning. Um, I think there's so much that can be learned from countries that have been experiencing the impacts of climate change for years. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, Bangladesh is a prime example where we can learn so much from and feed that into uh, the broad global thinking. So I think crucially, actually, in my role, I'm listening. Um, as I meet uh, with real experts from the Global South, uh, I'm listening to what they have to say, really learning from this and making sure uh, that that learning is informing the action that we take as UK president uh, and offer the opportunity to feed that in uh, in a very uh, act, you know, practical way to make sure that uh, we are getting the very best in the same way that you know, we need women and men uh, we need the experts uh, wherever they are from whichever part of our planet um, they are experts in tackling the challenges of the climate shocks that we all face. Wonderful, thank you. Turning to our last uh, panelist, um, Suranjana from the Huayru Commission. Please do put on your camera. Again, tell us a little bit about your work and then please go ahead and ask the minister the question. Sure, thank you, Aditya. Uh, I'm with the Vairo Commission and um, we are a global network that <clears throat> focuses on grassroots women's leadership in building community resilience. So I'm based in Bangalore in India, but we, uh, we, we have a global constituency that um, is engaged in building resilience, testing out solutions on the ground, transferring these solutions, and, um, and, and trying to scale them up with institutional actors. And uh, we, <clears throat> in different countries, are working with a number of different, um, uh, different institutions, um, which are, uh, could be local government uh, uh, to scale up solutions, they could be at the provincial level, they could be um, uh, regional intergovernmental agencies like uh, CEPREDINAC in C Central America. And, uh, and also we have a collaborative effort, which we hope the UK will fund, which is with the Asian Development Bank. And, um, but I think what we find um, is that despite this very large, important global constituency that has been doing work on these issues consist, uh, consistently for the last you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, this constituency of the most disadvantaged people who 
have very valuable knowledge, innovation, and solutions are still marginalized from not only the COP, but are not really on the national agendas in their home countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would like to see you as a champion of this global constituency as well. And I'd like to understand a little more about uh, concretely how you intend to support uh, these disadvantaged constituencies, particularly uh, those led by women who are bringing solutions to the table to actually uh, maintain an ongoing engagement with policymakers, both at global and at national levels. Thanks, Rajana. I think you're so right, and it's um, in so important to find ways to really move that forward to get that right. So uh, at a, a practical level, the UK has been working really closely with the World Resources Institute and obviously the Global Commission on Adaptation and the Global Resilience Partnership to try and incorporate uh, the voices and the priorities, as you say, of those grassroots uh, communities, organisations, and to build them into the international actions that are being taken uh, to address the climate change challenges that we all face. Um, so through our financial support to the Global Resilience Partnership and the Global Commission on Adaptation since 2019, um, we've supported both bodies to try and convene those influential global platforms that have had, they've drawn up and incorporated the voices of grassroots communities. Um, an example that brings to mind some Slum Dwellers International and BRAC uh, have really uh, been important uh, to bring those voices into that global debate. Um, so we're continuing to work with those groups and explore how we can further enhance grassroots voices at COP26 itself and other really major uh, fora and events, uh, including you know, obviously in the world at the moment, virtual platforms as well as those face-to-face -face interactions. And I think there's an interesting question there of how accessible um, we can make that, which we need to think about. Um, hopefully that this can lay really important groundwork for those organizations to be able to express and articulate their needs. And indeed, as you say, their own expertise uh, within their communities about you know, managing climate shocks, but also uh, to find better ways for them to be able to access uh, the finance and support that they require to really deliver uh, those adaptation resilience initiatives at local level on the ground in their community and to share their experience so that others can benefit from it too. So I think I don't I don't disagree. I think it's a, it's really important and I think it's quite difficult. Uh, but we're uh, using you know these many tools at our disposal to try and really provide platforms and to to harness uh, that knowledge and indeed those anxieties uh, through. But as, as we were talking earlier, I think one of the important challenges, which, you know, as COP president, we're very focused on and my conversations with, uh, you know, as I'm talking country by country with uh, partners is to really think about how uh, the NDCs and the adaptation plans that countries are pulling together uh, are put together with those grassroots voices as an important part of you know, the, the data and the, the understanding that come through so that at a global level, um, we're seeing those communities' voices heard through those national uh, sort of, you know, base, baseline documents, if you like, from which so much will be built. Um, so it's working at, at both levels uh, to make sure that those voices are as, as well heard as we can make them. Wonderful. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and to the minister. I'm going to turn now to a few questions that have streamed in from uh, the audience. Um, I'll be uh, I'll indulge in some nepotism and uh, prioritize one from Merrick, who's my colleague at IIED. Um, he says that last week the UK Prime Minister announced a commitment of three billion pounds over five years of international climate finance for solutions that protect and restore nature and biodiversity. He said, this is a welcome step. The crises of climate, nature, and poverty are closely connected, and we need to tackle the underlying drivers together. What else is being done to ensure that the, uh, the UK government's climate adaptation and resilience activities do not exacerbate nature and poverty crises and support positive outcomes for nature, biodiversity, and people? Thank you. 
really querying how you're looking at the intersection of climate change, poverty, mm -hmm. and biodiversity. Um, thank you. It's such an important question. And I think, you know, interestingly, when I'm talking, you know, out and about with my constituents and, you know, people who aren't, uh, you know, closely involved with the with the, the UN and the COP process, uh, they see uh, the question of nature and adaptation as one, you know, just one big um, pot. And I think, so nature is is both understood to be, I think, by, you know, the ordinary citizens and, and, and it's their right. Uh, getting that right is key uh, to making sure that we, um, you know, restore and balance and protect ecosystems. Uh, so that societies uh, can adapt to uh, the impacts of climate change, uh, understanding that, you know, healthy forests, uh, you know, successful wetlands help increase water storage, you know, they reduce the risk of flooding, uh, nature recovery networks can help provide species with the connectivity that they need to move uh, when there's, you know, a warming climate. Um, there's, there are so many things, you know, the loss of coastal habitats and land degradation is increasing in so many parts of the world. Uh, and of course, that increases the risks uh, of climate shock impacts from floods and from storms. You know, we're not even immune from that here in the UK. Our East Coast uh, can suffer from that. These things are uh, fundamental. So those nature based solutions uh, can really genuinely be a critical tool in reducing people's exposure to future disasters. I always think there's a there's a beauty and a simplicity to nature uh, and uh, you know we must we must respect and understand it better uh, if we are to uh, both look after it for its own sake but also for ours because uh, nature is very very well designed you know our wonderful Sir David Attenborough uh, here in the UK is making a, a TV program at the moment talking about nature and looking at this extraordinary balanced ecosystem uh, that nature runs and we need to make sure that we uh, get back in sync with it where we have fallen out not only for nature's sake but also because that will protect our communities uh, so the UK is really working to raise ambition on tackling biodiversity and those climate issues um, here and with all our partners uh, working with governments businesses and civil society it's a it's a whole of it's a whole of society approach that will get that right so there's a lot to do but the prime minister is really passionate about it wonderful the next question is from megan rowling who as i'm sure you know is uh, one of the world's top journalists who writes on these issues uh, she's asked please could you elaborate on the conference the uk government plans to hold in march bringing together the least developed countries and donors on climate change and development as mentioned by Alok Sharma at the Climate Ambition Summit. What will it aim to achieve? What concrete outcomes can we expect from it? Will there be new pledges on finance at this meeting? Thank you. Um, thank you. So this isn't a pledging conference. Um, as such, it's very much more uh, about, what do I call it? It's kind of a, a kind of problem solving opportunity. So bringing parties together um, to think about those big climate uh, and development issues and make sure that we are really focused on the most urgent, the most critical ones, and uh, make sure that all the voices that need to be heard are so that we're not missing anything as we go forward through the year to COP itself. Right. Um, one question from Salim De Cruz, who works with Salim Bhai at the International Center for Climate Change and Development. She's asked, what's the role of the COP presidency in influencing LDCs on one hand, and then developed countries, and she says, like the USA on the other? Yes, the great challenge of the COP presidency, and of course the extraordinary privilege is that uh, we have, uh, you know, the authority and, and the passion to convene everybody's voices. I think um, as important as bringing um, the US and, you know, major donors uh, absolutely into the central conversation about how we maximize our adaptation and resilience uh, impacts is making sure that those least developed countries voices uh, and needs are genuinely heard. Um, so that's partly why the Prime Minister asked me to take up this role as international champion on adaptation and resilience to make sure that those countries most affected by climate shocks and least able to uh, tackle them without uh, financial support and you know other technical support from 
uh, developed countries are that, that their voices are really genuinely heard and we make sure that we're not um, you know we're driving in the right direction for maximum impact for those most vulnerable communities so uh, the cop the cops presidency's role is very much bringing everyone together and making sure that we're really focused on the most critical the most important and the most urgent areas uh, not only in uh, making sure that the Paris Agreement tools are in place and that everyone is able to use them but at a more uh, human level if you like to make sure that that feeds through to the realities of what that means for LDCs and that major donors uh, and developed countries are absolutely focused on supporting those efforts. Wonderful, thank you. Before I hand back to our host, Dr. Huck, uh, a very genuine and heartfelt thank you to you, Minister, for taking our questions and giving us such uh, insightful, uh, crisp and forthright answers. A, a big, big thank you. Salim Bhai, over to you. Thank you very much, Aditya. And let me also add a very big thank you to you uh, for your excellent moderation. Uh, and also uh, a thanks to Anne-Marie. Before uh, I conclude, Anne-Marie, let me uh, just say a couple of words in terms of uh, uh, what we plan to do over the next few days. As you know, today is the first day of a seven day long event, which is going to go around in 24 hours uh, every, seven, every day for seven days. It's quite a big challenge for us, uh, <laughs> but we, we hope we can manage it. And then we culminate on the seventh day, which is the 24th of uh, January in the evening of our time, which is sort of a few hours after this. Uh, and uh, we, we and have invited you and you very kindly agreed uh, to join us at that session where uh, we hope to um, share with you some of the key outcomes that we feel are important and relevant for you in your role as the COP26 uh, a champion on ANR and to seek your guidance on how uh, outcomes from a conference like Gobeshana, which is very grassroots oriented, very practical oriented, uh, can actually make its way into the sort of jargon ridden COP uh, uh, world, <laughs> which I'm sure you're familiar with, and I'm quite familiar with as well. There's a huge disconnect uh, between these two worlds. And uh, I've uh, spent a lot of my time trying to make connections between them, but I'm not sure I've, I've uh, been able to do that successfully. But I, I found that one of the best ways of doing it is to have champions like yourself who are, uh, are, are willing to be guides, as it were. Uh, willing to be advisors and willing to be uh, uh, sympathetic ears to listen uh, to the voices from the, the vulnerable countries and the vulnerable communities within the vulnerable countries, even more importantly. And um, I, 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 I will ask you now for a quick, uh, uh, I hope, uh, uh, agreement that that will be your role and on uh, the 24th to come back and give us a little bit more practical guidance in terms of how we might take it forward. Uh, you mentioned the, the meeting in March, also the youth uh, COP by the Italians. We hope we have a big con uh, youth constituency within Gobeshana and we mm -hmm. hope that they will be able to make a contribution to that and, and other ways in which you think that it might be useful for us to engage uh, with more and more. We will be engaging with the uh, the COP uh, uh, champions on the uh, race to resilience as well. So we are in touch with that group and, and they are very much uh, sort of, we are in touch with them and we will be using uh, their good offices as well. So um, your, your uh, advice on how we can uh, maximize our ability to uh, get a voice in and then influence decisions that are being made by others where we, we generally don't even appear on the on the radar for those decision makers i'll, I'll give you the last word <laughs> salim thank you that's very kind uh i think uh your 24 hour seven day uh challenge is amazing and i shall dip in and out when i can to see how you're progressing i can't wait to uh meet you meet back with you at the end of seven days uh, and to uh, hear the conclusions you've reached. Um, and I think, you know, that I think my challenge to you would be where you see those uh, critical gaps, the voices that you feel aren't being heard, that really need to be heard now, um, and to work with you going forwards to make sure, as you say, that they are heard 
the wonderful thing about being a champion rather than a negotiator is that I am able to reach out and really try to um, to listen to those voices, which, as you say, have not always been heard, and then to make sure that we really try and drive those key areas of uh, the negotiations that need to work, uh, that need to be able to step forwards into the next stage of that building of our new, greener, more resilient uh, planet, um, and make sure that we are are hearing those voices. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, in, in and I, you and I have discussed this before, the question of women and girls' voices simply not being uh, in the decision-making space, not only within negotiations themselves, but uh, at a national level, at a community level, I think is a critical the one that we need to find ways to support countries who want to make that progress. Uh, that's really, really important to me um, because we are we are missing out on so much knowledge, so much expertise. Um, and issues that affect different communities in different ways. So I really look forward uh, to keeping a watching eye over your 24-7. I have to probably, I probably won't watch it night and day. I, I think you're all very impressive to be able to do 24-7. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic challenge. Do, uh, do and drop I, in and whenever I, you can. I will, and I will make sure our team, our team will, between us, try and keep a close eye on the... Uh, all the things going on. But I look forward very much to meeting up with you at the end of the week uh, and to be able to move forwards with you from there. So thank you to all your team who I know will be having an amazing week ahead. Thank you very much. Before we close, can I invite everybody to turn your camera on uh, for a, a few seconds so we can get a, a screenshot of everybody who's here? This is our new way of uh, having face-to-face -face meetings now, as you all know. <laughs> this is the reality we live in, the virtual reality, which is actually quite fun at times, so although you know you miss having a cup of tea with, uh, with each other, uh, yes. but nevertheless. So uh, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. I hope you found it interesting. And uh, let me say goodbye and, and invite you all to, uh, if you haven't already, register with the uh, Gobeshana app and then pick the session that you think might be interesting and fits your time zone uh, where, where you might be able to participate and, and uh, uh, engage and, and also definitely come back for the closing session on the 24th of January where we will have Anne-Marie with us again. Thank you very much and I'll say goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.